Good morning. God bless our worship today. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Dear friends, let us approach God with a true heart and confess our sins, asking Him in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to forgive us. Lord of life, I confess that I am by nature dead in sin, for faithless worrying and selfish pride for sins of habit and sins of choice, for the evil I have done and the good I have failed to do, you should cast me away from your presence forever. O Lord, I am sorry for my sins. Forgive me for Jesus' sake. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. God, in his great mercy, has made us alive with Christ, even when we were dead in our sins. Hear the word of Christ through his called servant. I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. For the well-being of all people everywhere that they may receive from you all that they need to sustain body and life. Hear our prayer, O Lord. Lord, For the spread of your life-giving gospel throughout the world, that all who are lost in sin may be brought to faith in you. Hear our prayer, O Christ. Christ, 
for patience and perseverance in this life, that we may not lose the hope of heaven as we await your return. Hear our prayer, O Lord. Lord, Lord of life, live in us that we may live for you. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Almighty God, you gave your one and only Son to be the light of the world. Grant that your people, illumined by your word and sacraments, may shine with the radiance of Christ's glory, that he may be known, worshipped, and believed to the ends of the earth. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who with you and the Holy Spirit lives and reigns, one God, now and forever. Amen. The Old Testament lesson for the second Sunday after Epiphany comes from the book of the prophet Isaiah, chapter 49, beginning with verse 1. This text is known as the second servant song, where God the Father is speaking to God the Son, and God the Son himself speaks as well. And we see that Jesus is that Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the whole world. Listen to me, you coastlands. Pay attention, you faraway peoples. The Lord called me from the womb. When I was inside my mother, he mentioned my name. He made my mouth like a sharpened sword. He hid me in the shadow of his hand. He made me a polished arrow. He concealed me in his quiver. He said to me, You are my servant Israel, in whom I will display my glory. But I said to myself, I have labored in vain. I have spent my strength and came up empty with nothing. Yet a just verdict for me rests with the Lord, and my reward is with my God. But now the Lord, who formed me from the womb to be his servant, to turn Jacob back to him, so that Israel might be gathered to him, so that I will be honored in the eyes of the Lord, because my God has been my strength, the Lord said, It is too small a thing that you should just be my servant to raise up only the tribes of Jacob and to restore the ones I have preserved in Israel. 
So I will appoint you to be a light for the nations, so that my salvation will be known to the end of the earth. This is what the Lord, the Redeemer of Israel, its Holy One, says to the one deeply despised, to the one who is detested by the nation, to the servant of rulers. Kings will see and stand up. Officials will see and bow down because of the Lord who is faithful, because of the Holy One of Israel who has chosen you. This is the word of our God. Our second lesson comes from Acts chapter 13, beginning with verse 38. Paul speaks to the people of Pisidian Antioch. So, gentlemen, brothers, let it be known to you that through this Jesus, forgiveness of sins is being proclaimed to you. Also, forgiveness from everything from which you could not be justified through the law of Moses. In this Jesus, everyone who believes is justified. So watch out that what is said in the prophets does not happen to you. Look, you scoffers, be amazed and perish, for I am going to do something in your days, something you would never believe, even if someone were to explain it to you. As Paul and Barnabas were leaving, the people kept begging them to speak again on this same subject on the next Sabbath. When the meeting of the synagogue had been dismissed, many of the Jews and devout converts to Judaism followed Paul and Barnabas, who talked with them and urged them to continue in the grace of God. On the next Sabbath, almost the whole city gathered to hear the word of God. But when the Jews saw the crowds... They were filled with envy and began to contradict what Paul was saying by slandering him. Then Paul and Barnabas responded fearlessly, It was necessary that God's word be spoken to you first. But since you reject it and consider yourselves unworthy of eternal life, look, we are now turning to the Gentiles. For this is what the Lord has instructed us. I have made you a light for the Gentiles, that you may bring the salvation, that you may bring salvation to the end of the earth. When the Gentiles heard this, they were rejoicing and praising the word of the Lord. All who had been appointed for eternal life believed, and the word of the Lord was being carried through the whole region. This is the word of our God. The Gospel according to John, chapter 1. Glory be to you, O Lord. This will also serve as our sermon text this morning. The next day, John saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This is the one I was talking about when I said, The one coming after me outranks me, because he existed before me. I myself did not know who he was, but I came baptizing with water so that he would be revealed to Israel. John also testified, I saw the Spirit descend like a dove from heaven and remain on him. I myself did not recognize him, but the one who sent me to baptize with water said to me, The one on whom you see the Spirit descend and remain... He is the one who will baptize with the Holy Spirit. I saw this myself and have testified that this is the Son of God. The next day, John was standing there again with two of his disciples. When John saw Jesus passing by, he said, Look, the Lamb of God. 
The two disciples heard him say this, and they followed Jesus. When Jesus turned around and saw them following him, he asked, What are you looking for? They said to him, Rabbi, which means teacher, where are you staying? He told them, Come, and you will see. So they came and saw where he was staying. They stayed with him that day. It was about the tenth hour. Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, was one of the two who heard John and followed Jesus. The first thing Andrew did was to find his own brother Simon and say to him, We have found the Messiah, which is translated the Christ. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise be to you, O Christ. Jesus, once with sinners numbered, had no blemish of his own. In the waters of the Jordan, his true worth and work were shown. Heaven opened and the Spirit There descended like a dove. As the Father's voice resounded, Hear, my Son, the one I love. Grace, mercy, and peace are yours from God, our Father, and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. We pray. Holy Spirit, through these words, testify that Jesus is the Messiah. Amen. Two disciples leave their teacher, John the Baptist, to go follow someone else. Jesus. Why? What did Jesus have that John the Baptist didn't? He was a great teacher. 
He could tell you all about how you should live in the kingdom of God. He was a powerful preacher. You should have heard him when he spoke to those self-righteous Pharisees who came out to him. You brood of vipers! And he was popular. People were coming to him in crowds. So why did they leave him to go follow Jesus? What were they looking for from him that John the Baptist couldn't give them? That's the question that Jesus asked them. When Jesus turned and saw them following him, he asked, What are you looking for? Not, Oh, hi, how are you? Not, Hey, I'm glad you're giving me a shot. No, he gets right to the point with a pointed question. What are you looking for out of me? And is it the right thing? What are people usually looking for when they go to Jesus? Maybe it's easier to answer, what are people usually looking for when they go to a Christian church, a place that claims to represent Jesus? Well, a survey a couple years ago yielded a top five. What are people looking for? Number one, they're looking for a preacher or a sermon that connects with them. Two, they're looking for a feeling of welcome by the leaders, especially. Three, they're looking for a style of service that they prefer. Four, they're looking for a convenient location. And five, they're looking for quality education opportunities for their kids. How about you? If we took a survey of our hearts this morning, or any morning you go to church, this church or another church, what would, what would you say? What are you looking for? What are you looking to get out of being here? Maybe some of those things in the top five. You're looking for a sermon that connects with you, a worship style that fits you, a feeling of welcome, sure. Maybe some other things that aren't on this list. You're looking for your friends, because this is where you see them. Maybe you don't know what you're looking for. You just got up and you went to church because that's what you normally do. And you know that if you don't go to your pew, then people will be looking for you. Maybe you weren't looking for anything. Maybe you're just here because, well, you work here. Or you had a job to do. Or maybe you're just here because your kids are singing. A lot of those things aren't bad. But if we have to pick one, if one rises to the top, there can be right and wrong things to look for. And I think John's disciples at first were looking for the wrong things. Because when John pointed out to them the one they should be looking for, it seems like they didn't go right away. What did John tell them in our gospel reading? John saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Look, he says. He's not asking. He's not suggesting. He's commanding. He's telling. Look, that's the one you're looking for. And who is he speaking to? A group of people who had seen worship in their temple. And in that temple, every time it had been functioning over the past thousand years, what would you see? Lambs being sacrificed. When worship started in the morning, a lamb was sacrificed. When worship ended in the evening, a lamb was sacrificed to try to make things right with God so that God could live with them. On the Passover, every year, an unblemished lamb was sacrificed. On every single one of the 14 days of the Feast of Tents, a lamb was sacrificed. Every time these people had done something bad to someone else, they needed to sacrifice a lamb for a peace offering. Every time they had broken God's laws and committed a sin against him, a lamb had to be sacrificed. But you know what those lambs never did? They didn't actually work. They showed what a burden of failure and unholiness this people had. But then those sacrifices became a burden too because they would sacrifice and sacrifice and sacrifice and still things wouldn't be made right. 
between them and God. They weren't becoming holy so that he could live with them. So what does John say? Look! Aha! There he is, the lamb that actually works. The lamb who through his sacrifice can make things right with God. The lamb who can take away your failures, your imperfections in front of him. That's the one. That's the lamb you're looking for. And John knew it was him because God had shown him. John said, at Jesus' baptism, the heavens were opened and God spoke and said, this is my son whom I love. And the Holy Spirit descended on him, anointing him, christening him as the Christ, God's chosen one, who could, through his sacrifice, take away the sins of the world. So John says, look. And what do his disciples do? It seems like they don't do anything, at least at first. Because what did we read a couple verses later? The next day, John was standing there again with two of his disciples. When John saw Jesus passing by, he said, Look, the Lamb of God. Why didn't they follow Jesus the day before? Why were people still hanging out with John instead of him? Did they maybe think they had already found what they were looking for? A great preacher, a powerful teacher, a place where they felt welcome. For those disciples, for people who often look for the wrong things, Jesus passed by again. And John proclaimed again. Look. This is the one you're looking for. It's the one you need to be looking for. And then they followed. The disciples followed Jesus, and he turned and he said, What are you looking for? And by the power of the Spirit, what did they answer? Rabbi, which means teacher, where are you staying? In other words, teacher, teach us. Teacher, where are you staying? Where can we go to be with you, to hear what you have to say, to receive what you have promised to bring? So that those disciples would look and see Jesus passed by again. But not just for them. He did that for us too. For people who often are looking for the wrong things who are focused on lesser things than the one we need to look for, Jesus passed by again. And John proclaimed again, Look, here's the one you need. Look, here's the one you need to be looking for, and he is here. We need to look for him. Because all of us are not so different than a man named Bob. Thirty years after the Challenger space shuttle exploded, a man named Bob Ebeling was interviewed. And he told the reporter, God picked a loser. Bob Ebeling was one of the engineers who worked on the shuttle. In the morning of the launch, he saw the forecast, and he knew it was going to be too cold. He knew that something wrong was going to happen. And so Bob got together all the information he could. He got together all the people he could, and he tried to go as far to the top as he could to warn them, to say, don't do it. He yelled, he begged, he argued. He pounded his fists on the dashboard of his car when they didn't listen and screamed, the Challenger's going to explode. Everybody's going to die. And that's what happened. They went ahead with the launch, and seven astronauts were killed instantly. And Bob felt so guilty. And he couldn't shake it. 
What do you do with that kind of guilt? You can't go back. You can't make it right. You can't make up for it. Bob tried to. He worked really hard as a volunteer. From that point on, he worked so hard volunteering that a president even gave him an award. But that didn't take away his guilt. After his interview was aired, a bunch of people started sending him letters saying, it wasn't your fault, you did everything you can, you don't need to feel guilty. And that helped a little, but not completely. It still couldn't take away that guilt, that burden of failure on his shoulders. Do you know what Bob was looking for? I wish I could have spoken with him. I wish I could have said, Bob, I can never understand this burden that you have been carrying around for 30 years, but I know someone who doesn't have to imagine it. I know someone who took that burden. I know someone who bore your guilt, who bore your failure. The Lamb of God, who takes away the sin of the world, the Lamb of God who took that failure with him to the cross and made it right. But I can't talk to Bob today, so I'll talk to you. Maybe some of you feel like him. That burden on your shoulders, that guilt from every mistake you've made in God's eyes, from every failure to live perfectly, the burden of all those things that you could never make right. Maybe you don't feel it right now, but you will in the future. But whether you feel that burden on your shoulders or not, God's Word tells us that every single one of us has such a burden of guilt and sin before God, a burden just as big as the one that Bob carried for 30 years, So what can I tell you this morning? Well, no, I can't promise you that in this pulpit there will be the best speaker on earth. You can take out your phone and Google TED Talks on YouTube and find much better speakers. And no, I can't promise you that here today you'll find the most welcoming place on earth. That award was actually given out already this year to the city of Göreme in Turkey. There's a lot of things I can't promise you this morning. But I can promise you one thing, that here in this place you can look and you can see the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. You've seen him this morning in the words from the Bible that were read, in the words from the gospel being proclaimed. He's here. Look around you. Look at the cover of your hymnal where the first two letters of the word Christ in Greek are printed. Because this word is about Christ. This book is about Jesus. And all of our worship this morning is all about Him. Look at the windows. Look at that innocent, unblemished Son of God who sacrificed Himself for all your burdens, for all your imperfections before God to forgive them and rose from the dead to proclaim that you are perfect in God's eyes because he has made it right. You can look at the altar and see the Lamb of God, Jesus, with his hands lifted in blessing, which is the reason why the pastors can stand beneath him and lift our hands in blessing and say, you will have peace in Jesus' name. You can look on the altar this morning. As we celebrate the sacrament, you can see the Lamb of God with his own flesh and blood that was sacrificed for you, coming to you to forgive you again, to remove that burden of guilt. And for every time that we forget, and for every time that we look at the wrong things, we repeat in song before communion, look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Look, Lamb of God, who takes away the sin of the world. Three times we sing it. Lamb of God, who takes away the sin of the world, have mercy on us. 
And he does. Today you have found him. You have found the Messiah, the chosen one who takes away your sin, the only one who can. And you'll find that when you find him, you'll start looking for something else to find. You'll start looking for someone to tell. Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, was one of the two who heard John and followed Jesus. The first thing Andrew did was to find his own brother Simon and say to him, We have found the Messiah, which is translated the Christ. We have found the Messiah today, the one chosen by God to take away our sins, to be what we really needed. And because of that, when you find someone to tell, you don't have to come up with something complicated. You don't have to come up with some crazy argument. All you need to do is say what Andrew said. We have found him. I have found the one who takes away my sin. And you can too. Amen. Psalm 89 verse 1 says, May you sing of the Lord's great love because his mercy endures forever. Amen. We now confess our faith together in that Lamb of God with the words of the Nicene Creed. It's printed for you on page 32. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, Light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became fully human. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who in unity with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen.
Dear Lord Jesus, we thank you that the greatness of your love and the tenderness of your mercy moved you to sacrifice yourself on the cross for us, that we, who are creatures of sin and death, might in you have righteousness and everlasting life. During this epiphany season, we thank and praise you for your testimony in your word that shows that Jesus is who he claimed to be, God's own Son, fully qualified to save us from our sins. Keep us forever grafted into him as living branches into the vine so that we can produce fruit in our lives. Lord, this morning we also pray for Scott Brechtelsbauer, who will be undergoing knee surgery this week. Bless the doctors and nurses who care for him. Make this surgery a success according to your will and grant him a quick recovery. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you peace. Amen.